Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you also um, to Marin and Philip for wonderful readings last night. Um, I hope everyone has had a good morning settling in here on the first day. Um, we're tasked, or we've decided, and by we I mean the organization, uh, decided to put together this first panel on the subject of nonfiction as an act of translation. And because this is the first panel, I thought I'd say just a couple quick words about how we often uh, organize these afternoon panels since we'll be doing them for the next few days. Um, each panel will have a theme, though we imagine and hope for a lot of intersections uh, and echoes uh, from each day to the next. Um, the moderator um, of each panel will work to pose a few large questions to the group, but as you can tell, it's an informal event. Um, we hope that the panelists will feel free to pose questions to one another, um, take the conversation wherever it feels most fruitful, and we'll try to leave a lot of time uh, as well for the audience to jump in um, and ask questions and take the conversation where they wish. Um, so first, uh, you all have uh, the biographies of all of our panelists, so rather than read them in full, I'll just hit a couple of highlights in each individual's bio here that seems relevant to um, today's panelist. Uh, and for anyone who hasn't met anyone or arrived today, um, this is a way of uh, brief introduction as well. So um, sitting immediately to my left is Philip Gravich, uh, who's a longtime staff writer for The New Yorker, firm writer of the Paris Review, and author of three books, The Ballad of Abu Ghraib, A Cold Case, and We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families. Stories from Rwanda, uh, and he's currently completing a new book, uh, Return to Rwanda, uh, called You Hide That You Hate Me and I Hide That You Know. So thank you, Philip, for being here. Um, and on the end is uh, Anthony Georgiev, uh, who was born here in Sofia and uh, emigrated, should I say this? Emigrated, fled uh, in 89 uh, to Denmark. Uh, he was a correspondent for the BBC World Service in London. Uh, is a renowned uh, journalist, photographer, and the editor uh, and founder of Vagabond Media, which included a number of magazines, um, uh, Vagabond Highlights and Go Greece. Uh, his most recent book, which is a wonderful book of uh, photography, uh, is called The Bulgarians, which just came out last year. Thank you for being here. Uh, Benjamin Moser, who is sitting on the end, is the author of Why This World, a biography of Clar Clarice Lispector, and the general editor of the new translations of Clarice Lispector in English. Uh, and he's currently um, completing the authorized biography of Susan Sontag. Thanks for being here, Ben. Um, Diana Ivanova, who's just to Philip's left, is a journalist, writer, director, group therapist, and curator. Um, she's the author, co-author, and editor of Traumas and Miracles, Portraits from Northwestern Bulgaria, my Street, Cuban Stories, How to Make a Bell, I've Lived Socialism, 171 Personal Stories, and My Street, 39 Street Stories. Thanks for being here, Tiana. Uh, immediately to my right is Dimana Trankova, uh, who is an archeologist by training and a journalist by vocation. <laughs> um, she's written extensively for uh, Vagabond Magazine and is co-author of a series of nonfiction books in English and Bulgarian on the country's historical and ethnic heritage, including uh, East of Constantinople, Travels to Unknown Turkey, A Guide to Jewish Bulgaria, A Guide to Ottoman Bulgaria, The Turks of Bulgaria, A Guide to Thracian Bulgaria, and A Guide to Romanian Bulgaria. Roman. Roman Bulgaria, excuse me. <laughs> and she's also a novelist. Her most recent novel, her second novel, The Empty Cave, actually just came out two months yep. ago. Yeah, two months ago. Yeah. Um, and lastly, not leastly, Lydette Randolph, who's the editor-in-chief of Plowshares and on the faculty of Emerson College in Boston. She's the author of four books, including a memoir, Leaving the Pink House, and three works of fiction, uh, Heaven's, Haven's Wake and A Sandhills Ballad. So there's my compressed bio. So thank you all for being here, and thank you all for being in the audience. Um, so I've spoken to each of the panelists uh, a little bit in the last day or so to have them begin thinking about this um, issue of imagining nonfiction as an act of translation. Um, we chose this as the first panel because one of the central themes of the seminars for the last 10 years has been, as you can imagine, translation uh, and how we think about it uh, from lots of different angles, traditionally in fiction, but we thought, why not think about this uh, this year from the angle of nonfiction? So, um, 
I guess what I'd like to ask each panelist to do uh, as a way of sort of framing and starting our conversation today is to talk briefly a little bit about the genre of nonfiction that they work, uh, or a more, most, one of their most recent projects or project they're engaged in, um, because each of them has been selected because they work in various genres of nonfiction, um, and to describe or have them think aloud a little bit about how that work might be thought of as a work of translation, specifically using the sort of Latin definition of that word as um, carried over, right, from translat, um, that word of translation meaning carried over. Um, Metaphilus. Yeah, bravo. <laughs> uh, and maybe as a way of sort of pushing into more interesting terrain to think a little bit about what's been most surprising or challenging about that. So I know that was a lot of things, but if each panelist could think a little bit, describe a little bit about the kind of nonfiction they write uh, and how they see the work that they do as writers as a kind of translation and what maybe some of the sort of challenges of, of that work is or the interesting sides of it to you if, if we think of nonfiction as a kind of translation. Does that make sense? Okay. And am I, is my pace okay, Boris? Okay. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to go slow. Okay, <laughs> next time. Who would like to begin? <laughs> photojournalism? <laughs> How's photojournalism uh, kind of translation? Is there anybody in this room who has tried Shopsko Salad? No, I mean, is there anybody in this room who hasn't tried Shopsko Salad? <laughs> you have? Anybody who hasn't? There isn't. <laughs> has any, is there anybody in this room who has not tried Shopska salad? salad? Yeah, you haven't. haven't okay, good one. <laughs> so I'll explain this to you. Go to the restaurant, dear man. They prepare relatively good Shopska salad. It contains cucumbers, tomatoes, some onions, some peppers, and grated. Uh, feta cheese, or Bulgarian version of feta cheese. Now every... Sorry? You're, 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 stealing, you're stealing my thoughts. Now every Bulgarian will swear, will swear with their hands on, on their hearts that this is the quintessential Bulgarian meal. Uh, they will say that it's traditional, they will even say that uh, it, it, it originates from the region of Sofia, where the notorious Shopi people live. Uh, and uh, they will say that this is absolutely the, one of the best salads in, in the whole world. Well, it isn't. It's a relatively new addition to, to the Bulgarian dietary uh, curriculum. And it was, it was invented, actually, as part of the communist era the communist-run Balkan tourist office in the 1950s for two reasons. One, because whoever invented it thought that it combines the, uh, the three colors of the Bulgarian flag, white, uh, green, and, and red. And then uh, when mass tourism was starting in this country, they needed to be prepared. You know, 20 people show up in the restaurant. They needed to have salads. So they pre-prepared pre the salads let them stay, and when the customers came, they just put the vinegar in the oil on it. Now, anybody who's traveled in the Balkans will know that there are essentially no differences between what in Bulgaria is known as the Shopska salad and what in Greece is known as Koryatki, which is the same thing, same ingredients. The only difference being that Greeks, perhaps, because it's so hot and they don't want to make too many physical movements. <laughs> they just cut, they, they cut the cucumbers and the tomatoes slightly larger, slightly coarser than, than the Bulgarians. And they don't grate the feta cheese. It's a plate of feta cheese. Now if you travel a little east to Turkey, you will see exactly the same thing, known as Chuban Salata. Chuban means, literally, the literal translation of Chuban Salata is Horiatik in English, which means in Bulgarian it sells Salata. But the difference, being, the difference being that in Turkey, they would chop very finely the cucumbers and the tomatoes. They would be very, very, very fine because Turks have, I mean, Turks have an eye for detail. 
and the details for the salads are very important to them. So, trust me, uh, it would be safe for you to, to assume that uh, the Bulgarian Shopska salad is in fact Greek salad made in Turkey. <laughs> now, if you say this to any Bulgarian, they will be instantly infuriated. They will be instantly infuriated, they will declare you a traitor, they will kick you out, they will, they will do whatever they can in their power to convince you that, that you, you've, been, you've slandered their country. This is my job. My job uh, is to, to explain what is sometimes overwhelmingly complicated realities in plain English, in simple sentences and in plain English. Uh, I can give you many examples of this. Bulgaria is particularly, uh, it, it's a very comfortable place to be, a, to, to, be, to be a documentary writer because it's full of instances like this. I'll give you just a couple of more examples. Everybody's seen that wall in front of the hotel. You have, haven't you? Uh, there is a sign on it declaring it an ancient Byzantine wall. Sorry? Well, there is a sign on it, and uh, the, the wall does look uh, slightly, you know, old, weathered, let, let me put it this way. Uh, the, the truth is it was, it was constructed three years ago from scratch, and we all have pictures of the construction process. I mean, we, we know the, the workers who did it, gypsies. Yeah, gypsies, we remember the scaffolding around it. And what they did is, uh, you know, in, in archaeology, uh, there is an international convention that whenever you build over original ruins, you've got to mark where the ancient stuff ends and where the new construction begins. They've even done this here. They, I mean, you can, you can see the delineation between what is supposedly ancient ruins and the new construction over them. Fake. Americans especially are starting to, to think about things like uh, fake news, uh, starting to learn uh, words like compromise uh, recently. But we've lived through this for many years. We lived, we've lived through this since at least 2008. And uh, in a way, we are you know, out, outperforming the Americans in this, I mean, outshining the Americans because uh, this is uh, the, the sad fact of reality in a place like Bulgaria. There is a government <coughs> which, there is a prime minister who sometimes declares he is pro-Western. Okay? <laughs> yeah, but this government contains extreme nationalists, unlike your government. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's tomorrow's panel. <laughs> Okay. okay, so basically what I'm trying to say that is this, I think that, that, that the, um, now, explaining those things, explaining the backgrounds, and doing this in an informative and balanced manner is what this whole exercise is about. Because um, it's very easy to, to look at walls on, or to eat salads and just you know, take whatever you are told for granted, but it isn't, there's a background behind it. And to understand that background, you need to know the details, you need to know the history, you need to know the, uh, the, the particular uh, circumstances of the creation of, of whatever you're talking about. And uh, that means that you have to be curious. You have to have the natural curiosity. Uh, and then the ability to translate that, that natural curiosity into, into a form of language, be it written or visual. I think that was a, a, a for, for, for starters, for starters, okay. <laughs> if anybody objects, I mean. Yeah. Dimana, what's your favorite food? <laughs> no. Um, Shopska salad. Shopska salad. <laughs> rather, than, rather than going around, uh, I'll try to sort of make some connections, but maybe because Anthony brought up writing about history and you were trained. You were trained originally as an archaeologist. Uh, you write nonfiction. You write journalism. You write sort of cultural history, uh, and you write fiction. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way in which you approach material differently in each of those veins, but specifically how you think about something differently when you're writing um, sort of cultural history instead of as a novelist, since your novels also engage history pretty strongly. Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> 
um, there, there are three ways to write about history. And I, I, I will start with academical one. Um, which uh, for, for an outsider can be very boring because it's so obsessed with details, particularly in archaeology. When r writing this kind of text is like uh, describing <coughs> a crime scene, like a forensic uh, uh, thing, be because you need to note every detail and in order to preserve it, you know, you just, you are left with the traces of something that someone did 200 or 300 years ago, much, much, you know, earlier than this. And uh, it can be very boring, particularly when it is, uh, uh, what it, it, it includes something like pottery industry or flint industry or something like this. But behind these boring details, there is a story hidden, which tells a lot about how people used to live in the past. Uh, when I'm writing nonfiction, um, I'm not concerned that much with these boring details. You know, I, the reader will want, doesn't want to know what kind of particular pottery was used, for example, here in Suzopol, uh, when it was a Greek colony, ancient Greek colony, you know, in details. But what the reader can know and could be interested is that these pottery traces the, the trade routes and actually the connections which this ancient city used to have back in the ancient time. So when I'm writing nonfiction, I'm trying to say the true story and the story of the people who are behind all the traces which, uh, you know, which we see, like these fake walls and the not that interesting real walls. And um, writing a nonfiction, of course, is, uh, you know, it's binding because you have to stick with the reality, you know. You, you cannot make up stories about how these people lived or what they thought about. And uh, in Bulgaria, we have this uh, growing problem with uh, writers who just take whatever it's written in Wikipedia. They often just copy the text and you have, have plenty of texts which are very, very much alike and are very non-critical and they just repeat what have been written in uh, Bulgaria's official tourist site or in Wikipedia or in some kind of web forums which are the nurturing ground for these nationalistic, chauvinistic people. So this is my job as a non-fiction writer, just to say the story as it used to be according to the evidence we have. And um, because I use history in my fiction as well, it's, um, of course, I, I, I continue to, to follow, you know, what has been established against uh, what is popular, you know, to, to, to speak about today, like what was our past. But uh, fiction is kind of, uh, I'm, I'm more free when I write fiction because I can take bits of realities and just mash them up and combine them and come with something which is new in a way but uh, is based in, on reality. So, yeah. I didn't anticipate going entirely around the corner, but um, what Anthony was talking about with thinking, what Anthony was talking about um, with the sort of precision of language and trying to sort of break through uh, to change these old perceptions and what um, Diman is talking about with these idea of true stories and traces, uh, I think those two things uh, make me want to ask um, uh, both Diana and Philip to talk a, a little bit about uh, their work next and then they can move towards biography and autobiography as a sort of transitionary move. But maybe I can actually start with um, Diana building off of uh, uh, what Dimano was talking about with, because you do a lot of work with documentary and true stories and that phrase of hers, true stories and traces, made me think a little bit about um, some of the work that you're doing. Uh, yes, listening to Anthony now and to uh, Dimana, I was thinking that um, uh, in a way I'm, I'm doing similar things but in another field and uh, it's the field of feelings. Because living in communist time or living in dictatorship, like in general, because I can compare my work in Bulgaria and Cuba also, I think leaves all of us with, uh, we live in one monumental time where there are many 
monumental ways of the way we should feel, the way we should read literature. There are many narratives which are quite monumental. And actually, we are not aware going after this time, when this time ends, that this monumental time has left traces in us, that we are the one that cannot talk about feelings because nobody asked us how do we feel. We are the one that have to, to, to break out of this and uh, uh, we have to go to our own sub subjectivity which never was um, uh, very important in dictatorship. Subjectivity doesn't matter. What? Sorry. Sub subjective, being subjective, being yourself and being aware of what you feel uh, and being aware that what you feel matters and can be also told as a story. And this is something that's my point of departure in everything of what I'm doing. I actually started with um, this project that we did with uh, Georgi Gospodinov um, and Truman Petrov about I lived in socialism, collecting personal stories about communist time. And I remember when I gave this book, and it was a book created by everybody could write in this book, a story of one page. And I remember when I gave this book to one neighbor in my street in Sofia, the, his first reaction was, oh, how these people can write about this time, nobody was in power. So I'm giving this example that the, the monumental way of talking was about history, about um, the past can talk only people who have been in power. So the one who just lived on their streets, what, what they can say. And I had the same uh, feeling when for the first time I went to Cuba and we did a project there just asking people to write about their streets. They asked us, but what should they write? And when we told him how you feel on your street, it was a completely new experience for them that they can write about what they feel on their street. There is no narrative, you should write like this because some tourists expect you to write like this or to describe it. So I find this field of um, opening a space to talk about feelings and to translate the communist or the monumental period into many subjective worlds and ways where you can, which we can compare and work with them, are one of the most important things um, for me as a journalist uh, who has experience in that time and in the time after that. And I, I had to work with myself first, to ask myself first the question, how did I feel about many things, because nobody asked, asked me this question. And recently I also realized that, um, because I'm writing also now in German, and I realized that um, I have a particular affection for the German language, because I, have, I connect the German language with feelings. And when I say to my friends in Germany, for me the German language is a German of feelings, they Oh, wow, how, how do you come to this? They don't understand this. And I, I finished the German high school in Montana, in my home city. And the only teacher in our school, I finished 1986, the only teacher who talked about her own feelings, she talked about love with us, was our German teacher from the GDR. The only one. With everybody else, we talked about many other things, but she confessed to us some love that she experienced at one period when she was in our, uh, in our town. And I never will forget this, how authentic she was and how she trusted us, that we uh, can understand what she's talking about. And that's why um, this remains maybe in me as, as an example that uh, languages can translate feelings and Bulgarian language can be used to translate exactly these words that always have been hidden or, or for, for many years. So thank you. Philip, that's actually a great sort of transition point. Um, um, Hot-blooded Germans? <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that, that was my pivot. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I'm curious thinking about these ideas of language and these narratives of power, and I'm thinking about, you know, your first book and all the counter-narratives that were happening um, in Rwanda, and I'm curious now that you're, you're going back recently, um, back to those, those narratives, how the writing process, and particularly the process of translating national-level stories you know, um, has shifted for you since that, for the first book was, what, 98? And now you're... Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it seems to me that all writing is translation because obviously you're taking uh, perception and turning it into prose. So it, you're taking, you're, you're, you're creating a representation of something and that means that you're not, you're not just handing the people the thing itself. Um, and uh, and so inherently you're you're carrying things from one set of inputs and putting them out in a different one. But my work, it's not really like I have to imagine translation because uh, to the extent that I've done a lot of work in as a foreign correspondent, 
uh, in Rwanda in particular, but elsewhere as well. Um, language is an enormous problem when you're working in multiple languages. And when you're translating a society, a culture, uh, uh, languages, uh, often several languages within a place, um, so that if you're interviewing people through an interpreter, um, you're basically not really interviewing them, right? You are having this kind of artificial encounter, uh, exchange of language. So I don't actually know what anybody I've, ever, I've written about has said when I'm interviewing them in Kenya, Rwanda. And just to make things more sort of um, ludicrous, I've been working for the last five or six years, and for much of the time in the first book I was working with, francophone um, interpreters, because they were the guys who like were in the business and I ran into and I kind of liked. And I mean, there are plenty of people who speak Kenya, Rwanda and English, but um, for some reason, because my French is much worse, I thought I would make it harder for myself. And then there is this kind of liberating aspect of that where, where you are uh, suddenly confronted with the real problem of writing, right? You can't simply quote directly. I, when I report in America, there's this incredible freedom because I'm using my language, I'm using their language. Their language and their idiom and everything else comes sort of bursting into life. And also I can shorthand things. I remember shortly after doing about uh, a piece on uh, finishing the Rwanda book and then doing some stuff in Korea and about North Korea, where you have to just write all this history, you know, and you have to just get every sort of basic stuff to get your reader anywhere at a level where they can begin to understand anything subtle and mm -hmm. anything interesting and understand the references. Mm -hmm. And, and here I was suddenly covering the 2004 campaign and I remember starting a piece with John Kerry was in New Hampshire last week and said, and I thought, you know, <laughs> I didn't have to say John Kerry who was a senator which is an institution that was started 250 years ago shortly after the British were repelled on conquered territory taken from the Indians and his, you know, was in New Hampshire, one of the first 13 colonies in a sort of northeastern area known for his conservatism despite his liberal bent. You know, it's like, boom, here we are. We're talking about it. You already knew he was in New Hampshire last week, 95% of the readers, and it was great. And then he says something that I would never quote if it was a foreign person because it's about it's, it's at a different layer of, of uh, communication already. That, so, so, in a way, foreign corresponding is really very foreign. Uh, you are constantly in the, in the business of trying to get people to this place where, and this is the fun or satisfaction anyway, of writing books as opposed to shorter pieces when you're doing it, which is that after a little while, you start to get a reader to a place where they've got a bit of a frame of reference and they can start building off it and you can say fewer and fewer expository details to drop in a line and have that line at least mean to them some of what it meant to you when you heard it. And of course, the more you do the reporting, the harder this becomes because the more time you spend in a place, the more actually sophisticated and complicated your set of references are. And somebody says some little thing and you're like, oh right, if that was that year, that means that this had just happened and I actually talked to seven people they know about this village, so I know. And then you have to unpack all of that backwards, right? And the language. And Kenyawan is an expressive language. It's a lot of idiom. Um, so then you use paraphrase, uh, and I'm, I really feel uh, there are some countries I, where I won't work uh, as a foreign correspondent because I don't know the language, like in Latin America. Because in America, so many people speak Spanish, and I don't, that I feel it's ridiculous to go down there and be basically writing for an audience that could read at least 20% probably or 40% of the New Yorker's readership and probably 40% of the people who don't read the New Yorker can, can, could read the newspapers there. So I've gotta be doing something more. And it's a different kind of translation there. And also, I should just know the language. In Kenya Rwanda, there's not a chance you're gonna get any, I mean, it's like saying if people have to know Kenya Rwanda to write about Rwanda, there will be no foreign awareness of the country. So it's a different problem. It's a different problem in Cambodia. It's, a, it's on the fence in a place like China, you basically have to, it's big enough also that you get specialists and people will learn Chinese and spend years doing this. But in a place like Rwanda, I'm embarrassed about the fact that, you know, I've spent these years there and even amongst the academic scholars, quite a few don't really speak in Rwanda. So I feel like we're writing about this kind of version of the country. And then we should be honest about that, which is to sort of acknowledge that this is a, a representation of like what's being given off and, and to sort of show that, to remind readers of, while you're trying to prune them really close of various ways in which you're also distant. Like keep reminding them that there are panes of glass between you and it. And I, I mean, it's something I've noticed on this 
new book. Uh, in the first book, I was using a somewhat more conventional, uh, I suppose now it's more conventional, I've come to realize, uh, version of, of, of writing nonfiction where you take a person's story and as you tell it and paraphrase and quotation, you often sort of uh, don't keep reminding people that it's, they're the source and you just absorb it and create and it, like their voice becomes this authoritative voice. So this is what happened to that person and it's clear that they're the source for it and if there's other people, you can say his neighbor said or her mother told me, but here I'm doing this thing that's almost more like Raymond Carver where I keep saying he said, she said, you know, uh, they came from over there, she said, it was, it was just down the hill, she said, and then she said, I felt strange, she said, you know, I'm like boom, 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 I have no idea if this is true, this is what she said. <laughs> And it yeah. becomes interesting also because a lot of this stuff has now been through a legal process. Uh -huh. So a lot of genocide testimonies are also bouncing off the fact that things were said in court, which aren't necessarily the same thing the same person says when telling you the same story outside of court. They're not necessarily wildly different. It's not like that, but it's, you know, like this maybe. So again, I want to kind of remind you of the limits like, I'm going to take you very, very deep and very close, and at the same time, this is actually really limited, and most of what there is to know about a person, we don't know. Um, and sort of remind you of the fiction of, of, of mm. knowledge. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. I mean, maybe that's also a good pivot then to sort of move over to talking to Benjamin, especially off that last sentence where you're talking about sort of limit some knowledge and taking somebody really, really close, but also the, that awareness of, of distance. You know, when you're writing a, a biography, you've done the work with Clarice Lispector, now you're working with, on Sontag, is that almost like working on a, a country, do you know what I mean? Like there's a way in which you're talking about sort of translating an entire experience, cultural country, you're, you've got this in, singular individual, but doing this sort of long, deep work. Yeah, it's funny, when you're talking about what you assume people know and what you assume they don't know, when you're writing, I wrote about Gladys Spector, who was a pretty unknown figure in the United States and in pretty much anywhere outside of Latin America and Brazil in particular, and I wrote this for an American audience mainly, who I assume knew nothing about Brazil. It's pretty easy to assume Americans um, don't know a lot about the rest of the world, even though that's sort of a stereotype that I don't like to encourage because actually um, Americans probably know more about the rest of the world if you put them all together. There's a, huge, um, there's a huge amount of knowledge in American universities and in American um, publishing. You can find uh, great scholars and, and, and knowledge about. But, you know, I was writing a book that was trying to take, to take across, you know, to translate someone from a country in which it was actually the first, I didn't know this at the time, it was the first time there had ever been a biography of a Brazilian writer in English. And um, which is kind of shocking if you know about Brazilian culture and literature, but it's not that shocking in other ways. And so I wrote all these things that I thought sounded kind of stupid, you know, for Brazilians. And I was almost kind of embarrassed to say, like Rio de Janeiro famed for its beaches or something, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and that's a stupid example too because actually a lot of it goes back, at, I mean she starts in 19, she's born in Ukraine, uh, right that away, um, in Podolia, right north of Odessa in uh, 1920, at a time and at a place of complete horror and at a place in which history was really deliberately destroyed um, and you're talking about monuments. Monuments, um, especially of the quote unquote foreign populations, the foreigns were the, the Catholic Poles, um, the Jews, uh, the Russians, you know, all of these peoples, and the Turks also, who had always lived around the Black Sea. You know, there were mosques in these places, they were all destroyed, the synagogues, everything was destroyed. Um, but then, uh, so I assumed I had to explain that. Um, but what really surprised me, I assumed that when the book was published in Brazil, that it would, all this stuff would be taken out. Um, and in fact, it was the opposite. I said, you know, we don't really have to say that, do we? And they said, yeah, <laughs> actually, we have no idea. Like, we might learn this in school, or you might know who was like the Minister of Education in 1938, but actually, you can just say it. And people really liked that. So it was funny that I was, I almost felt, felt condescending, but people, and I would like that too. I don't really know who was the minister. Well, we don't have ministers in America, but you know, the secretary of housing or something in 1940. 
And those are very consequential people and they make very important decisions for how this society is going to look and how who's going to be educated and not and who's going to be uh, able to be a journalist or a writer and who's going to have to work at her father's furniture shop and never have an education. Um, so that, I actually was really excited about that. And now with Susan Sontag, I'm writing about my own culture and my own language. And yet the foreignness of it has really struck me every time in all these areas that I thought, you know, Susan Sontag died in 2004 in Manhattan. You know, I was, that doesn't feel like, wow, interesting to me. You know, that sounds like, you know, like I know like what restaurants people were eating at in 2004 in Manhattan. I know like what people were reading in the New Yorker and like what um, like stupid thing was on TV that everybody liked. And yet, actually, when you go into a life of someone like Susan Sontag, you see how quickly things change and how many little revolutions kind of add up. And the two areas that really struck me, um, first of all, you're talking about German, which was the language of my family on my father's side, but also, it was also the language of culture in the United States until way far after the war, until deep into the 60s, um, French and French culture, for example, was condescended to. It was considered that the culture of Marx and Freud and, and you know all the great Germans was considered the superior European culture, not England, not France. So that's one thing that changed. But really, um, and so in the intellectual realm of like how do you write a novel, um, which is something that starts getting reformulated in France at the end of the 50s and, and, and this has an effect on all these American writers. Nobody remembers that Americans wrote nouveau roman, you know, which are horrible. I mean, you can't imagine how bad they are. Like Susan Sontag's early novels. I mean, you, you just, you really cannot read it. I mean, I have a contract that basically says you have to read all that stuff. And so I have to read it all. And there's, that's like, you know, fate. And, but it's, it's really interesting when you kind of read it in the context. But the two areas that really become interesting to me are writing about women. And this is a woman that I would think of as, I mean, she's older than I am, but she was alive until I was 30. So it's not, it doesn't feel like writing about a Brazilian who died before I was born. Um, that how women related to their, to the world I would say, and to society was just completely unimaginable. And the other thing is about how gay people related to the world and what gay people were thought to be and seen to be and how they saw themselves. It is totally unimaginable. And I was talking to Evan the other day about being gay in certain countries. I don't know, I mean, Bulgaria, I'm not sure, but I've had this experience in, in like former Yugoslavia where being gay is not even a category that exists. Like, people will say to you, like, so are you married? And you say, no. You say, well, do you have children? No. And then you say, well, do you have a girlfriend? And like, no. And then the question that, like, in Western Europe and the United States, people would be like, well, you're probably gay. Like, they would have gotten there way earlier than, <laughs> like, in Bosnia. And, uh, <laughs> like, and in some countries, and that was, but that was true in the United States until, like, the 90s that someone like Susan Sontag, who was totally gay, and everybody who knew her knew that and had known it for 50 years, that actually the first time that there was an interview, that this was actually published, was in 1994, and it was published in England, in The Guardian. No American newspaper had said, even though you know, she was in a relationship with the other most famous lesbian in America, who was Annie Leibovitz, but this was something that like people just didn't see. And so, you accumulate all these kind of things and you realize you have to explain to people who, about people who aren't old, who are still alive in a lot of cases, that they actually come from a totally different world. And that becomes, for me, really an interesting challenge because sometimes you say things that go over the line. You know, you say things like Abraham Lincoln, who was president during the Civil War, you know, and you think, okay, wait, maybe. I can delete that part. But then you say other things, like when I was teaching in California a few years ago, my students who were graduate students were very smart students of Latin American literature. They had heard of the siege of Sarajevo, but they actually had no idea what that whole thing was about. And they didn't remember it because they weren't born. And this seems to me like 20 minutes ago. And so, 
you're always kind of weighing that, and the thing that you say today that is obvious might not be obvious in five years, because five years is the amount of time that it takes to get through high school. So I learned a lot of stuff in high school that I didn't know when I was not in high school, and then it became obvious. But so you're always kind of working, and I like it, though. I think it's a nice role for a writer to play of a kind of translator in the sense of someone who gives cultural knowledge maybe to different countries in the case of Brazil or in the case of younger people who just haven't read the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's great. Um, Benjamin, you were talking about, that it really struck me when you were talking about, you know, it's 2004, you know what restaurants people were eating in Manhattan, what they were reading in the New Yorker, and then you said, but then you start to go into the life and you find this foreignness that sort of surprises you. And that made me think uh, this might be a nice inroad to have you talk a little bit, Ladette. I mean, we think we know ourselves as humans until maybe we start writing books about ourselves. <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, I was building off of um, Benjamin's comment about foreignness, uh, sort of uh, thinking you know a thing until you start exploring it, pushing it a little bit further. Uh, and I wanted to sort of turn that question towards Ledette and have her think about how it is to write about oneself and who we think we know, but then sort of find that foreignness. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it made me Definitely. think. First of all, um, Ben, you just so totally depressed me as I thought about uh, this, had the importance or the power that uh, these secretaries and administrations have in thinking about Betsy DeVos and Ben yeah. Carson and you know <laughs> the trouble that they are causing us. Um, so something that Philip said about all writing is translation, I would say, of course, that all language is translation and that everything we are trying to communicate to one another is always imperfect. and. Um, and so there's always just such opportunity for misunderstanding in language. Um, I think of myself primarily as a fiction writer, and it's where my real heart is as a writer. And so my um, beginning to write nonfiction was something that I did very reluctantly. And I did it because uh, when I first started writing fiction, I was writing these funny, dark, weird stories, and maybe they were actually really true to me. And looking back with some maturity, I say, oh, it's too bad I didn't trust that. But at the time, I was really uncomfortable about them in workshops, um, the MFA workshops. And um, so I kind of assigned myself at that time um, these essays that I really didn't intend to publish. I thought, I just need to write this out, because whatever this dark thing is, or this maudlin thing in my fiction, I really need to get at the root of that. I need to, to get after that. So I wrote a series of like 25 little essays over a period of four years, um, really had no intention to publish them, ended up publishing about five of them. Um, didn't think much about it. It wasn't going to add up to a book. Um, but then, um, many, many years later, I had another project that I was sort of working on that also didn't add up as a book, but together they, they began to work together. So I, I resurrected those old um, essays. But for me, a lot of this has to do with process. Um, I think uh, when I look at my process as a writer, it tells me more about what I'm doing than anything else. When I'm writing fiction, um, I'm not thinking about the reader at all. I'm simply on a journey, and I don't really have an idea what I'm going to do when I start. I have a very vague sense, maybe, of um, a question, or maybe a little bit of dialogue, or just something that seems to be crackling around the edges. And so I really literally write into the blank page, and every day that I end writing during that disco discovery draft period, um, I'm, I'm writing myself out onto a limb. And um, so it's a very exhilarating and very terrifying thing, but it's also wonderful because it's, you're in the, what John Gardner called the fictive dream. And it's what keeps me coming back to fiction because um, the fiction writers here will understand that it's kind of addictive. It's a loss of self. Um, so when I started writing nonfiction, it was a completely different thing. Um, I, I did not have that kind of sense of freedom. Um, I was always very aware of the reader as I was writing. I was trying to communicate something, and I was indeed felt like a foreign correspondent going into my past and looking at my past, even in the, the kind of recent past, and, and trying to be really honest about um, and self-aware. That's a very diff difficult thing for me to do, I think for most of us to do. And I wasn't real comfortable doing it because it was um, 
uh, not what I wanted to be doing as a fiction writer. Um, so anyway, I, I did that. Um, but I also, I think that, that there was a point then where um, I, I was always empathizing with the reader at the end. I was always thinking about that I want to communicate an idea because I know this material and I think I have something to tell. And so I want the reader's experience to be a good experience. And so that kind of empathic reading. And also what um, Rebecca Solnit talks about um, in terms of, of the book, um, that the book is the solitude where we meet. And I love that idea that um, you know uh, the writer is needs the reader to complete this text. And so that's I'm not going to go on too long about this, but that's yeah. great. Uh, there are sort of three branching roads ahead that I'm trying to oh, to, to choose uh, from there. Um, one I'd been thinking a lot about nonfiction as an imaginative act, which you're sort of gesturing towards a little bit with sort of writing into the blank page at times and where genres intersect. And I've been thinking also a little bit about just genre in general. All of you work in different genres, um, even different forms, book length, short pieces. Um, but, um, so I'm also thinking about sort of the challenges that we each face as writers. Um, but I'm actually maybe building off of Lidette where I'd like to go and then I'd love to turn it over to the audience so we can sort of answer shortly, briefly, and then give, give time here since we're I'm aware of the clock, um, is thinking maybe just briefly about the one side of the craft for you um, that you you feel you're still most struggling with, uh, or you still is, is, is a, a, f a challenge at the forefront of your craft, um, whether something you thought was going to be easier when you started this journey as a writer and has remained a, a challenge, or just something that's really important to you that you wrestle with uh, in the art of non, uh, non-fiction, however you'd like to interpret that question. I have one. Please. <laughs> I just thought of, I mean, it, for me, because um, Philip and I were talking in the bus yesterday, Susan Sontag was a very difficult person. Um, and she, for a lot of reasons that I understand, because I have been in that mind for a long time, and I know what happened to her as a child, and I, I understand how she got there. Um, but Philip was telling me about yesterday how he was working in a bookstore in New York and Susan came in and she was looking for some obscure volume of, of German philosophy. And one of the kids who worked there, I assume it was a kid, you know, a young guy. My age, yeah. yeah we I mean, were kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and he, he trying to be nice to this very famous woman and probably trying to make a good impression, and, you know, you can see how excited he was. He's like, oh, we don't have it here, but I have a copy at home. I can bring it to you. <laughs> and she says, great, you know, and so they make some sort of appointment, and he brings the book back, and she comes and gets the book, and of course, I say of course because I know her really well, she never gives the book back. <laughs> and it was like a pretty valuable book, and it came from abroad, and, you know, it wasn't, like the internet, you can now get anything. But once your little book of German philosophy was gone at this point, <laughs> that was pretty much it. And um, he also knew that she knew she had stolen it. <laughs> yeah, and she did. But but she I mean, always stole were, things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, his she response was, was, "Of course she stole it." Right. It, the weird story would be if she didn't. <laughs> That's what. Yeah. People will come up to me like, "I've got something to tell you." Susan Sontag was really mean to me, and I'm like, "Yes, like." <laughs> I'm familiar, like, I don't know the exact date and time, but yeah, I get it. And, um, and Susan, I mean, I understand the reasons for this, that Susan did this. She was extremely needy in a way that is, makes all the enviable things about her life seem very unenviable because by doing this constantly to people, she lost friend after friend and lover after lover and her family members and, you know, um, it was sort of a tick. It was a pathology, really. And so with Clarice, when I wrote my first biography, I loved her. And the more that I got into her world and into her writing, the more grand she became. Uh, I think that with, with really great artists, this happens. You know, the more you learn about them, the bigger they become. Um, and with Susan, she sort of shrinks as she gets older because all of this painful stuff that happens to her in her life kind of just adds up and it, it, it makes her just very sad and unhappy for the last decades of her life. 
And, but you, as a biographer, I mean, the really hard thing in this case was the empathy, keeping up that empathy, because actually, I'm mad at her for stealing that book. Like, she did shit like that to people all the time. I mean, and it was mean, and it was entitled, and it was obnoxious, and it was cruel often. Um, and sometimes there's a real difficulty in, like, what, how many of those stories do I put in? I mean, I took out quite a lot of them because actually Susan is a lovable person in this totally perverse way. She's actually this heroine. She's a great woman. She really is. She's also a monster. But like, how do I want, when you're talking about being aware of the reader, like I actually want the reader to like her. I want the reader to read her and think about her and be inspired by her and not just think, oh my God. because. So many days when I was writing at my computer, I was like, I can't believe I have to spend another day with this woman. Like, she is so mean. You know, she is so, like, I can't believe she's, like, stiffing that waiter for, like, that extra dollar, you know, or whatever, something like that. And, and then, but then if you're aware of the reader, you want them to like her, ultimately, because I actually like her in the way that you like some relative that's kind of awful. You know, like we were talking about, like Ilif and I were talking about this morning about, uh, well, I don't know if you have racist relatives. I have racist relatives, like I do. And some of them are really nice people. And you sit there sometimes and you think, okay, well, they're 90. So of course they come from a different time or they have, and I mean, so it's possible to like people who aren't entirely likable. But you do see it in biography a lot that sometimes people turn against the subject. And a great example of that was the South African, well, he's not South African, but he was in South Africa writing about Nadine Gordimer. And she had chosen him and they were great friends and it was gonna be fabulous. And he turned against her halfway through the book. He just started hating her. And that's actually, you can't really let that happen. And sometimes it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Other things you wrestle with, challenges? It's all hard. It's all, well, yeah. I know. <laughs> it's all pain. Yeah. It's all pain. <laughs> Why do we do it? Yeah. 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 It's all pain. Full stop. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's all hard, but some things, I mean, you know. The things you want to wrestle with that, are ma that matter to you. Yeah, like this seems something, this matters to you. It matters because yeah. I'm talking about translation yeah. in a literal sense. Yeah. I actually, I'm responsible for Susan's work in a lot of ways. Like if I tell you Susan Sontag was a horrible, horrible person and she writes about this in her book on photography, like you can, if you take somebody, even a beautiful person, you can make an ugly yes. photograph of someone. You can make a caricature of someone. You can only emphasize the bad sides of somebody. And you can also go the other way and exaggerate this angelic, saintly aspect. If I did that with Susan, everybody who knew her would think I was an idiot mm -hmm. forever. I would have no reputation because everybody knows this stuff, but how much do you say? And, and it's not easy. That's because that's carrying too, right? I mean, that, you I want her that. work to go on and I want something of her life and I want something of what she went through as a human being to be understandable to other people. I think one of the most important things that uh, anybody who is uh, dealing with documentary writing has to have in ample quantities is courage. Courage is, uh, is a scarce commodity and courage in a place like Bulgaria does not mean courage elsewhere in, the, in America or in, in the West. Again, you need some background for this, to understand this. Bulgaria at the moment, being a member of the EU, being a member of NATO for about 10 years now, is actually at the bottom of uh, all uh, conceivable indices of press freedoms. Bulgaria is rock bottom in terms of freedom of the press in, in the EU, and one of the last in the world. And when we're comparing to, we're talking, we're not, we're comparing to I mean, even Turkey is better. No. Is it? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
and uh, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of topics. I mean, courage comes whenever you you select your your area of writing, your topic. And uh, there are topics which are very clearly uh, dangerous in a place like Bulgaria. And I'm not talking I'm not talking dangerous like Watergate. Uh, I'm talking dangerous for uh, even things which happened in the past, even the history can be can be a dangerous commodity in a place like Bulgaria. So uh, I think that it's very important to to to, to come to the realization that uh, whatever uh, may be considered um, acceptable and uh, and a matter of course in a in a culture does not necessarily translate into something acceptable and a matter of course in a different culture because there are different traditions different different backgrounds and um, Talking of being gay, for example, is uh, is a, one of the one of the taboo subjects, basically, in a, in a place like Bulgaria, and there are many others. Um, my impression is that even though there is Bulgaria is very fertile, fertile ground for documentary uh, writing and for, for particularly for investigative journalism, um, many people who are dealing with this are are going into, into the easy way. And the easy way is writing about the past, writing about communism, writing about... That's easy. That's like under communism, you know, 30 years ago, it was very easy to be critical of the Tsarist regime yeah, yeah, in Bulgaria. <laughs> yeah. uh, but communism is gone. That's ancient history. I mean, that's 30 years ago. Uh, very few people, in contrast, would be dealing seriously with the crimes being committed in post-communism. I know just a, just a handful of those people, and they're not very popular. So I would be grateful if you share you know, other views on this, and uh, especially uh, how it is in, in other cultures. Because the purpose, as I understand it, of this gathering here is to exchange ideas and to, to see how we can be uh, you know, helpful to each other. Can I just say, I know I've talked more than everybody else, so I'll shut up really quickly, but I just want to bounce off of this for a second. Um, what's interesting to me, one of the interesting things to me about Latin America, and one of the reasons I like Eastern Europe is because it is so, oh, sorry. Um, it's so, Eastern Europe and Latin America are extremely similar in so many ways. Um, even like the way the restaurants use really bright lighting, like these kind of things. It's weird to see, it's like 80% the same, and then there's this 20% that's different. But like Poland will be different from Brazil, like 3% more than Mexico will be different from Romania. But basically, a lot of the structures, I think what makes it similar um, is that, is the amount of taboos and the amount of unspoken things. Like in Mexico, journalists are actually murdered. I mean, they will show up at your door with a weapon, and they will kill you. Now in Brazil, they don't do that because the Brazilians are very, they like this idea of themselves as very polite people. Of course, if you look at the statistics, they kill a lot of people, but <laughs> they don't really kill journalists. But what I discovered writing my book about Clarissium when it was published in Brazil, people would say, this is so courageous. And I was like, it's not that courageous. It's about like this mystical novelist, you know? I mean, she, it wasn't like something about some mass grave in Rwanda or communism. I mean, it really wasn't. But people would say things like, I mean, really silly things that I didn't even think about, like about how people dressed. Like I would say something like, so-and-so was a notoriously ugly dresser. And, you know, these are like poets in Rio. Nobody expected them to, but they were like, wow, you know, nobody's ever said that before. Like, we know that, but we don't say it. And after this, there was a big censorship controversy because in Brazilian law, as in a lot of Latin America, you can use little laws to ruin people. Um, and that's their purpose. I mean, it's not that there's some old colonial holdover or something. Um, and it's very easy if you live in a poor country where as a, as a journalist um, in the United States, you, you can pretty easily get another job. Like if you're a professor, you can write stuff or you can go to another place or you can move to another city. 
But you know, in, in a place like Brazil, which is in the hands of a very small and very powerful oligarchical structure that's been there forever, they can just be like, you know what, we're rearranging the copy department and we're totally sorry. And this can be like three years after you offend somebody powerful. But the, point, the, the result is that the history of Brazil and the biographies that should be there, just they don't exist. It's not like they're censored, they're never written. And so that's a challenge that I became aware of. As an American, I just go and I say whatever I want. And I have a passport that lets me, you know, if people don't like it, they can blog about it. But I can go to the airport and I can leave. <laughs> I don't depend on, like, if Brazilians or Bulgarians think I'm a horrible person. But, you know, if you live in Sofia and you write in Bulgarian, and there are eight people in Bulgaria that you're not going to say anything about. You're just going to maybe not touch it. And that area of subjects becomes bigger and bigger as people are not courageous enough to do it because they can't be. Well, it's also true in small town newspapers right. in the United States where we have the most liberal press laws in the world. There's a great deal of inhibition and a great deal of fear uh, may not be an actual physical fear of annihilation or a fear of incarceration, but it's a, a fear of basically, uh, well, being ostracized at some very profound level or just getting into conflicts you don't want to lift the lid off of these accommodations. So there's a lot, I mean, and there's a lot of literature about the way that these things are enforced in places where there isn't necessarily, you don't need a dictatorship to have a very repressed society. Um, societies self-repress quite effectively, often on a very local level. And I mean, one of the, you asked what's hard. Uh, one of the things I find hard is, is actually um, always just sort of handling the weight of other people's kind of anguish about various things and getting that across uh, without making it lacrimose and just heavy, you know, here, I, I went and heard somebody with a sad story, now let me make you sad about it, because that's not the purpose. But, you know, Rwanda is a place where also journalists get killed, journalists get jailed, there's not really a, a free press in any way that we would recognize that there are uh, newspapers that report news, and it's complicated, and, and of course all the press activism from the outside is about newspapers, and nobody in Rwanda can afford a newspaper, or there's no viable business model for a newspaper, but the radio is actually much more dynamic, and since none of us understand Kenya Rwanda, we have no idea whether it, what's going on there, but my understanding is that there's a bit more going on there. I'm more interested, though, in like ordinary lives that aren't involved in sort of, you know, confronting the state, and what do they want to talk about and not talk about, and where are their sensitivities, and so, you know, I was just thinking about this when you were talking about what people do and don't talk about and where you feel the need to sort of either protect or, you know, show or so. So I had a young woman who messed up my head because I just sort of walked into this interview expecting it to be another interview with a uh, person who was a victim of this one killer in this little town that I've been going back to for almost 20 years now. And, and she had been 10 at the time of the genocide. And she suddenly just like whoosh, talked for three hours straight and, and told me in incredibly graphic and vivid detail her very terrible story why she was pretty much all alone in the world now. And, you know, her father had been killed before her eyes. Her mother had been raped and then killed with her. She had been raped at 10, this, that, the other thing, then bad things had happened. But at the very end, and she told all of this with a lot of intensity and a lot of clarity and a lot of intelligence about sort of where the limits of what she knew and also a couple of things that were a little bit mad and hallucinatory that came through. And then she's like, now I want to tell you something that's, that's really very sensitive and I want you to know this and I, I don't, and I don't, I, I just need to talk to you about this. And she started to like get all choked up and she started to weep. And it was like, completely had nothing to do with all of that like what we think of as the gross and hard to imagine to how anybody could bear at traumas. It was about how she'd been living with her grandmother or her great aunt, and she had, from the end of the genocide, and her great aunt was this old lady who I knew reasonably well for an old peasant lady. I'd gone to see her a lot over the years. And she had taken care of her. And it had given this young girl who had lost everybody a tremendous satisfaction to have somebody to look after, to have a home to be in, all this. And then she said, but then I said to her one day, you're an old lady. You're going to die, and I'm going to die one day, and probably you're going to die sooner. 
She was like, nobody knew how old she was. She didn't know when she was born. You had to like go back to a witch kingdom. And, and uh, she was probably, I figured, like in her late 80s, which is old there. And she said, you know, what's going to happen to me when you die? Will I be, what's going to happen to this little house? And the house, by the way, is a hut about the size of this, well, stage twice over made of mud. You know, it's not a very fancy house, but it's a house and it's something. And the old lady basically didn't answer. And she said, you know, I loved her, but she wasn't a good parent for me. And I realized it was going to go to her granddaughters who actually had other things, but it was going to go to them. So then she'd heard about like some houses for survivors and, it, and she got one, but it was way away. So it isolated her. It was like she'd been shelved by the state on the side of this hill as far as she was going. And she was like, did I do the right thing? Right. And she got completely choked up. And this was what was sensitive. And when we left, my interpreter was like, you know, it's very, very, you never hear a woman like saying I was just raped when I was 10 like that in this country. And I, that was interesting to me because I'd, I'd heard it before, but it was also, to me, what she was really saying is it wasn't like done to me personally. It was done to me as a, it was like a crime committed on me the way you'd be attacked violently. It was a, it was nothing about me. It doesn't tell you something about me, right? That that happened to me at that age. I mean, it tells you something about my makeup now, but not then. And it was about them. But this was about me. This was about, and it was about her being a young, grown-up person with agency, right? Here, it wasn't something that happened to her. It was a decision she'd had to make. It was relationships with people who are still around. It was all of these things. And this, like, the world trembled for her around that much more. And it became then, like, do I use this? How do I use it? Obviously, nobody I'm writing for could, is like, there's no violation of her secrecy there. Nobody's ever going to find this person, and, and nobody cares, right, about this detail, where they might, if I was talking about her and the killer or something, be interested in that. That was fine. And so I think one, you know, we often get just so aware of these, the giant power structures that we lose track of the things that actually inhibit people much closer to the ground, even people who have those kinds of relationships and stories and are living in dynamics of tremendous political and social complexity, that what they're still engaged in and what they're still sensitive to and who they care about is not what's the court gonna think, what's the minister gonna think, what would happen if this is in the newspaper. They couldn't give a shit about that, frankly. They're thinking, what would my second cousin think if she knew that I was saying something that, about that old lady being unkind who was in fact really kind to me? Yeah. And when that sort of unravels, you're like, oh, you know, maybe they're not all living in fear and silence because of the state. Maybe they're like the rest of us. I mean, it's a translation thing more than a yeah. what's hard thing, but it's both. Yeah. yeah, going back to your question, what is difficult in this translation, and also as a remark to what Anthony said, that it's uh, like easy to talk about the past. Uh, uh, I don't think it's getting easier, it's getting more difficult. And this is what I'm struggling with as a, on a personal level, how to find the language uh, to talk and to open new space uh, without this narrative that is divided for more than 25 years in two categories. You are either anti-communist or you are pro-communist. So it's like uh, the language uh, of our common talk about the communism is frozen and, uh, and the, uh, in the way it was in the 1989, with a bit of, little bit difference maybe. But there is a very little space for going into the into the shadows and into the finding that there is no simple perpetrators and simple victims, but we are more intervened in these roles. So there, there is still a lot of space in this. And this is my, um, yeah, my personal question, for example. I noticed in these 20 years of my own work that I'm becoming more interested in the perpetrators. Like for the first time I can say it's more interest, it becoming more interesting to see how to convince these people to talk in a new way. I'm just because first they have occupied the public space. This is one of the problems of Bulgaria. And that's why nobody wants to talk with them or some of us don't want to talk with them. So I had to overcome my own shame in a way, my own um, um, ugly feelings. I don't want to talk with these people because my po point of departure was exactly 
people from the ground who has never been in the power, like the village, why I'm doing a festival. Like, and then in the village also you realize, when in Balerechka some people know that I do this festival there, half of the village worked in the police in the communist time. So once went to, the, uh, to Sofia and then the others, so half of the village was when we have to translate this into the language where at the part of the perpetrators. And we see them now as victims because they're poor, they're old, they're completely... And this is, for me, something that we still need to work on, and I personally, how to, uh, to open this uh, space, uh, because many people don't even want to, uh, to enter the debate because they are afraid they will be, uh, if, they send, uh, if they bring a shadow story or something that is not completely on the side, they will be immediately categorized. You are on this side, on this side. And we all know it not, was not like that, but there is still a lack of space that uh, we make this uh, conversation like relevant to today, let's say, because this past is completely connected with what Bulgaria is today. Like, this past is here, but somehow we see it as a past and the now is different. That's why I find it more and more challenging to connect the both things and even more difficult to talk about the past in a, this more reflective way where we see each other and start to see each other as really having both parts. Of course, there are people who have to be more, are more responsible for what happened, but going to the village and to other examples, um, there is actually a great book, uh, maybe some of you know, uh, by an uh, American anthropologist, Gerald Creed, that was written se several years ago, Domesticating Revolution. And this book, um, it was one of the best attempts for me to explain. Uh, he lived in a village in Bulgaria for more than 20 years, before the changes and after the changes. And he tries to explain how the people in the village who actually have been... <laughs> Who, 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 these people who before the revolution were actually uh, um, uh, enemies to the, to the Communist Party. The, so they had to, they had to go to, to become proletarian. How they, in the, in the, in, in the time of com Bulgarian communism, became actually the most pro-communist because the people in the villages voted for the Socialist Party. Like it was the, and he, he explains exactly how this domesticating happened, that everybody took something from the communism and made it in his own village way, his own, and it was difficult after that to depart and to take to another part. So I'm just, uh, because I, after this book I never read something so deeply um, connecting with the explanation why we are at this point and why we are not moving maybe in the way we want to move forward. And without the irony, for example, I find sometimes difficult to ironize ourselves that we are not moving forward. We are the way we are, we have our own pace, and we have to be more, to talk with more dignity about ourselves, the way we, the, the way this society works. This is, uh, and to, to share, that's why I'm sharing this, it's my own, um, uh, yes, I have my own deep, um, um, how to say, um, insecurities. How I deal with this and am I able to bring more people into the topic that they think it's relevant to, uh, the past is relevant to today. So. Yeah. We're considering Anthony's question, the first question from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so we've begun the Q&A. Um, again, in this in this way of thinking. I think one of the most important thing and one of the most difficult things in, in my work is how we interpret our past. And um, we, you, you all talked about you know, oral stories and what, have, what, what people talk, talked about you. But I want to tell you that even when you deal with the traces of those people, the past can be interpreted in a number of ways. Like, look at the, look at the new part of Suzopol. It's ugly, right? So it would be uglier in Brazil. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, it'll get ugly. Imagine the ruins of the, those buildings after 2,000 years from now. And if an archaeologist, an archaeologist or uh, I need the distance. Um, <laughs> comes here and just found all those ruins, he would, has the, would have this narrative about how flourishing Zopol was in the early notice, how developed its civilization was. And um, then he will probably 
discover or not discover the non-existing sewage system and he will probably have another thought, you know, that that civilization was not that developed. But this is, this is, this is the difficulties, you know, how do you uh, translate the traces of the past, even when they are material one, um, to, 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 the, to the present? And if you add the fact that I'm writing most of the time for foreign um, foreign audience, I don't, I don't write mostly about Bulgarians. I write about foreigners who are interested in Bulgaria. <laughs> then you have this another level of difficulties. Uh, yes, like every time I write about Bulgarian food, I had to explain what Shopska Salata is. <laughs> <laughs> What a nice circle back to the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Dad, do you want to add anything? Um, do I have anything? Um, well, um, I, you know, I hate to break, you know, when I'm just talking about sort of my little memoir, it feels so self-indulgent. Yeah, when, when you're, you know, speaking about memoir in the context of this very serious discussions and, and the work of journalists, it feels really self-indulgent. But one thing that I, I've heard a couple times here is that um, idea of the, the personal narrative and how important personal narrative is through a, a particular historical time or an experience. And I think um, maybe that's where I have to feel all right about the work that I'm doing because I was writing about uh, growing up fundamentalist in a rural place, and um, that kind of what I called nomens of ignorance, and fighting your way through that uh, with very limited tools. And so I think that, that for me, that was a very useful kind of exercise, but um, I think for maybe uh, some people who are still there, it, it could be helpful. And um, but we never know. We, we don't know how any of our work matters in the future. So I think um, I had to write that. I don't need to write another one. Um, but when you talk about, um, and I'm going to bring this down a little bit again, you talk about what we struggle with. Um, what I realize that I struggle with is that I can draft very quickly and write very quickly. And then um, because I'm an editor, I have a very bad habit and I uh, revise things for five years and for longer, and then I, in fact, abandon things. So I have, a, I have not published two novels and enough short stories to be two collections, and I think that's okay. I'm all right with that past, and Philip Graham, I know, is doing an AWP panel about this. And so it's not, I, I, I don't say that with apology, but I think that I um, am beginning to realize that this is a problem that only I can solve. And it doesn't mean that I have to, uh, uh, not revise. I obviously think revision is very important, and especially for literary work. Um, but I, I think that I, I overpolish, and that I am taking off some of the the things in my work that are those traces of what it means to live in this moment. And I'm trying to make them too perfect and too um, crystalline, and that's not real. And so this is my kind of journey, you know, now as a, as a writer for the next um, projects. And, and of course, you know, like all of us, I'm, I'm completely stumped right now because of Trump. And so I can't write and I don't know where to go. So I've got lots of, those are my things I'm struggling with, um, just to be very personal. Yeah, no, it's great though, I think that, you know, this panel, as I said at the start, is, is allows us to start a three-day conversation and, you know, um, t um, tomorrow will be, Donovan will be moderating a panel about public narratives, which I think will naturally pick up some of what Anthony's, uh, question Anthony raised and what we've been discussing over here. And I think on Sunday when we talk about private narratives, what you were just discussing about who's left behind and who's a part of the story that's yours, I think all those, the, I look forward to these threads you know, being pulled through over the next couple of days. Um, my boast about us having plenty of time for questions was a foolish one. Um, we do have, a, I think, time for maybe one question. Take, take a couple. A couple questions. We don't all have to answer everything. Yeah, yeah, there we go, yeah. yeah. But uh, what, what has arisen here, and again, we can, we'll keep talking over the next few days, but what, what is, is pressing to you after listening to some of this? Svetlo? Uh, to the society which 
had to, 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 yeah, sorry. Uh, to society who have, let's say, iconic or uh, sac sacralized some images or historical mm. events, and in the mentality, if we take a part of the mentality of, let's say, American people, mm. like we have in Bulgaria, it's a, a kind of stereotypes, and to explain them the real truth. Mm. Not the post truth that they That presupposes that there's some agreement what that real truth is. Um, I mean, I think, certainly as far as American history or American discourse goes, there's a constant um, revisiting of the same events. You know, the way people understand the Civil War in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the Civil Rights Movement and then afterwards and, and then suddenly in the light of Trump or something, just to take a pretty big event in American history, um, is constantly changing. People are, it's a matter of both people changing focus, but it's also the filter of the times that draws different people's imaginations and interests towards a different aspect of it, or some of it's quasi-accidental. Somebody will stumble in the course of one kind of research onto something that they had not understood before, and uh, it cracks open a perspective. Um, you know, the, the real truth, what, of, let's say, the genocide of the American Indians? Uh, there's been a good deal of information available about that over the years, but there's never enough uh, books that, to come along to, to drive it home. Um, how do you, you know, there's always the fluke between is the information there and is it well told and how it somehow captures a broader imagination and, and gets digested into a story that is told differently. Um, I, think, I think in every society uh, there's sort of the tendency to start out by teaching a kind of ci civic, a favorable civic story about your country. Right, you tell them about the heroes, you tell them about George Washington and the cherry tree and we liberated ourselves from the British and even though most of us, our parents were living in other countries at the time, um, you know, but we did that. And, um, and then they, the people who were here when we weren't here, had the Civil War and slavery, right? And, and things like that. Um, but, you know, you learn about those things, but as you get older, you go to, if, if you're getting anything, even a decent public school education, never mind a university, you know, by the time you're in high school, you're getting a somewhat more critical take on that. You will have teachers who've been educated sometime in the last 10 to 20 years, at least they'll have kept up with the literature on, on you know, challenges to these historical accounts. You will, but then along comes Trump and starts glorifying Andrew Jackson the mastermind of, you know, the Trail of Tears. And suddenly people are debating Andrew Jackson again, who seemed like a fairly settled matter. They just booted him off the $20 bill in favor of Pocahontas. Or, uh, not, uh, who was? But there was, no, there's another one that has uh, Sojourner Truth. There's like... Oh, no, it's Harry Tubman on the 20, right? It's the 20. But anyway, I mean, they got him off the money, which is a pretty, you know, major place. Um, you know, that, that Ray Charles song is now dated when you give give the streetwalker 25 bucks and have uh, you know, Lincoln and Jackson shaking hands. Um, it's it's, it's going to be some Harriet Tubman and Jackson shaking hands. I mean, Lincoln shaking hands makes more sense. But so you have this kind of constant revisiting of these things. You know? What does Kennedy mean? What does the Vietnam War mean? Is, it's not a fixed matter. There is no certain, there, and I think part of it is that there, it's not that there's a truth and a falsehood. It's that there are shifting understandings that are being contributed to by a lot more information. And the information isn't always changing, it's the accent that's being put on it. It's the places of where you're focusing on it, what it means, you know? I mean, let's remember that to a person like Jeff Sessions, our current Attorney General, the story of the Civil Rights Movement, the exact same truth facts is the story of a catastrophe that happened to American history and the story of white supremacist movements throughout is the story of a great underdog movement that still has a chance, maybe a last chance, but a noble cause. That's how that guy thinks, right? You're not going to get that guy to read the same history book and, 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 and word for word and not come away with a different conclusion, you know? There are people who read, you know, a Holocaust book and they're like, that's an excellent 
story. <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think Martin Amos made a, that novel of his where he, Time's Arrow, where he does the Holocaust backwards, which is kind of an amazing, just virtuoso performance, is actually, it's kind of obvious and then it's kind of deep because it reminds you of how much history can be wound in different directions with the same exact story. You know, but when all the ashes come down the chimney and turn into people back in their living rooms in Berlin um, over time, it's sort of a reminder that, you know, I've always thought Holocaust denial is, e you know, some people think it's really evil. I think it's really weirdly optimistic. I mean, it's a kind of like reality denial, but it's also like what an amazingly strange world to inhabit where these terrible things didn't happen, you know, um, and, and to fight for that idea. So you're always up against, it's a permanent struggle. There's, this, is not an, this is not a struggle with an end. It's not something where you're like, the truth happened and prevailed. That's immediately going to attract somebody to say, no, it's not. Yeah, but uh, when you created some iconic name, I'm, I'm just imagining if somebody wrote the uh, um, geography of uh, our patriarch of our literature, Ivan mm -hmm. Basu, and said that he's a cheater or he's a really bad minister of education. Uh, it will, here it was become, you know, he was the, uh, he will be killed and uh, it's oh, terrible. Yeah. We have icons, we, we, we sacrificed some of our yeah. images of writers or, uh, yeah, Can I just come in on that a second? Because I, I wanted to come back. I was really interested. You were talking about monumentalism, mm -hmm. which I've, I've written a book about that now in, in, in Brazil, about monumental architecture. This is part of this monumental thinking. That you right. Have, yeah. right, and monumentalism is a really, uh, it's an idea that I think prospers in unfree places. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you say something about George Washington in the United States, well, I mean, George Washington was a great hero, and he, and, and justly, a great man. He was also a slave owner, and there were all these other things. And people can have two ideas in their head at the same time. Where you don't have two ideas is in an unfree society where he's only the guy on the statue. So, you know, maybe the guy was great and he founded the University of Sophia or whatever. I've never heard of this person, so I don't know. But, like, I, every country has those people. And in Latin America and in, in all unfree countries, there's a tendency to put these people physically, I mean, in granite and stone mm. onto the pedestal. And I think that what you should aim for uh, when you're looking about truth and, you know, what is true and all that, I think true is the idea that, that, that people are complicated and that history is complicated and that, that, you know, that's okay and that's not really even that interesting. Um, a lot of great people do terrible things. Um, and some horrible people do great things by accident. <laughs> so you never know and um, I think that the, 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 the aim that we should aim for as, as writers or as translators or as educators is to be able to make people aware and, and not comfortable with that complexity. Mm -hmm. so. But here this monument is really, really strong. But it's the same history. No, but if you go to, listen, if you go to Poland and you say something about Chopin, you know, the entire country will come to an end. People <laughs> will be so devastated in a way. But like, if you go to Britain and you say something about Shakespeare, yeah, or, or Queen Victoria or Shakespeare, I mean, you know, people are educated to be able to understand. No, nobody cares because they're, they're able to think that a person is complicated and even a great person is complicated. I disagree about Poland. Really? <laughs> Who else? The Pope. The Pope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, seems like a great place to pause this conversation until we rejoin it uh, over drinks. Uh, in the next few days. So no, thank perhaps. You so much.